How's everyone doing? It's getting late, uh, but thank you for showing up here. I, uh, you show your dedication. Um, I hope our presentation will worth your time. Uh, my name is Ivan. I have my colleagues separate. Today we are going to talk about our efforts uh, for training and deploying the multimodal foundation model for document automation in Uber. Um, it is about document automation, but at the same time, I'm sure our presentation can be generalized to uh, a lot more use cases. So let's get started. The agenda for today is we will start with motivation, and then it will be the juicy part about how we build a model architecture and pre-training, and how we fine tuning for downstream applications. Uh, and also we will show the evaluation comparison with GPT and also latest Llama 3.2 vision model. Uh, and also uh, in the end, we will do a quick demo. Um, so before we talk about the Petrini and model, it's important to sh share more context about why we are building this. Uh, inside Uber, we are processing 100 million plus of documents annually. If you think Uber's business is an uh, iceberg, these are the huge part under the water surface is invisible, but uh, they are very essential for the normal operations and uh, the functioning of business. Uh, so what happened is if I'm a driver, uh, I, I want to onboard to the Uber platform, I need to upload my driver license and vehicle insurance, uh, registration, and all kinds of forms, and they need to be transcribed to extract all key information. At the same time, we have grocery delivery, and then we will get receipts from our shoppers, and we need to do a lot of checks on there. So a lot of uh, documents, also a lot of document types, and not to mention a lot of different languages. It poses all kinds of challenges. So the, main the first motivation to build a foundation model is it's very slow and expensive to transcribe this amount of documents manually. Uh, and it slows down the process to onboard new drivers uh, to validate grocery receipts and process invoice, uh, a lot of different um, um, business process. Uh, and also very expensive to transcribe each one of them manually. But at the same time, it's very difficult to scale to thousands of document types um, with one model at a time. Because um, every document type has their own uh, target fields to extract. So you need to um, kind of develop a new model for it. But uh, we, we have find empirically training a model from scratch need at least one million to two million um, docs examples just to meet the launch criteria. Um, but this is huge long tail problem means that many documents just don't have um, a lot of examples trained. Uh, so we need a different approach. And that's why we want to build a tr strong foundation model to automate the whole process, uh, leveraging all the in-house document data and speak uh, all the uh, languages of our key markets uh, and leveraging all the modalities we can have, text, layouts, images. Um, so overall, that's the motivations for developing this in-house foundation model. And next, I will have my colleague Sabresh talking about the juicy part of the pre-training and the model architecture. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Sabresh. Uh, I will talk about the model as well as some pre-training tasks we do to make this good enough for deployment. Um, so our model is an encoder tra decoder transformer model and we want to encode all the information we have uh, initially and then send it to the decoder so um, when we get an image uh, so uh, we extract OCR from it for people who don't know OCR gives you both text spatial coordinates as well as confidence of each extracted text from it now we want to encode all this information uh, using our encoder so for the image part alone, uh, we use a lava style uh, system where we split the image into four quadrants and then send it through an image encoder, concatenate all the uh, embeddings of the patches. And res with respect to the OCR, we first uh, encode the text using our tokenizer and then send it to our encoder. So in the encoder is where we also induce the spatial information of all the text as well as images. Uh, so we have modified our self-attention block, which will compute attention not only with att uh, text and text or image and image patch, but it also uh, computes uh, <coughs> attention between spatial and spatial coordinates, and we add it together. So in this way, the model, uh, each token has some kind of spatial awareness, uh, and then we send this encoder uh, to the decoder along with the prompt. Uh, <clears throat> the next part is pre-training this model. So we have few tasks which we do to make this model learn 
natural language, which is present in the document, as well as you know, uh, have strong understanding of what to extract for each entity we want to. Uh, so the pre-training task itself can be split into both encoder, decoder based, as well as encoder only tasks. So for the encoder, decoder, we have two main tasks. One is the entity extraction, the other is a phrase localization. For entity extraction, basically we give a bunch of entities to be extracted at a time and the decoder will generate that values in that order. And for phrase localization, we randomly pick a phrase and ask the model to predict its coordinates. So the model can learn where this text is from and utilize the spatial information which we gave in our encoder. <coughs> and for the encoder only task, we have MLM. And we also want the model to learn the characters in the image. So for each image patch, we ask the model to count number of characters in it. Um, we, and then we all have other encoder tasks like document classification, image quality, et cetera. So what it takes to create a strong foundation model. So first we have like 50 million documents across 120 different document types. So we utilize all the modalities we have, like text, layout, images, and everything. And we have built uh, lots of infra using Ray, uh, which can help to stream this data set as well as train uh, as fast as possible. And we, not only that, we have also realized uh, building our own tokenizer has pretty good advantage. So it can support all the languages, as well as we, all, uh, you know, can each digit can be treated separately. Um, and our Training pipeline is very configurable, so it is easy to add any kind of task we have, as well as we can extend to add any kind of augmentation on the data. And we have a pretty good monitoring system. Uh, I'll hand over to Ivan to talk about the train infra. OK, training infra. I can spend one hour on here. Uh, but for the sake of time and just talk about the highlights, uh, we built the training infra very tightly using Ray framework for scalability. But at the same time, uh, we put a lot of emphasis on uh, fast iterations um, uh, and, and also training throughputs. So on the high level, uh, we have a bunch of documents uh, inside the company, but we need to source and curate the data sets for training. So we do a lot of, we spend a lot of efforts curating the data sets uh, and do a lot of samplings to uh, end up having a pre-training data sets. Um, and then we will load data sets into a rate data sets to shard across the workers. So each worker will get their portion of training data. Uh, and inside it, we implement a streaming data loader of um, uh, which will load, load data from the object store uh, and then do a lot of pre-processing on both the OCR and image and cache it uh, locally into, into the uh, each of the host. Uh, and then we will uh, feed the data loader to the trainer. Inside the trainer, we have PyTorch, DDP, as well as DeepSpeed for in, uh, speed up the training. Um, just a few uh, quick points here. Um, because we run a lot of experimentation, so it's important for us to um, speed up the data pre-processing. So that's why we build up the caching, so that within a training job, we can reuse the uh, cache built from the first epoch. But just beyond that, we also run a lot of the experiment in the same clusters. So we want to reuse the ca uh, cache across training job. Ray data says it doesn't, uh, by default, out of box, it doesn't provide deterministic sharding. So we also spend efforts to implement the sharding logic so that we can make sure that uh, when uh, every time we launch a new job on the same host, uh, in the same cluster, uh, the sharding will be deterministic so that the previous uh, cache can be reused here uh, to save some time. We spend a lot of efforts here and there to optimize those details uh, so that we can speed up the overall iteration process. Um, OK, so those are about model architecture and training. Now let's talk about some applications. Um, so first of all, uh, document transcription, as the name says, that whenever we got a no new document, whether it's a driver license from US or from France, uh, or it's a vehicle registration forms, um, we will uh, extract the, the target entities from the documents. Like here, uh, we have a list of entities from the driver license. And essentially, we will uh, feed the document image and OCR to the CVFM model, which is the foundation model. Um, and we will prompt the model with the target fields uh, we are expecting, and it give us the uh, uh, target values um, in, in outputs. Um, we will have a, we will show this in more detail in a demo, um, and we. Uh, 
because this application is very accuracy uh, uh, heavy, uh, we spend a lot of efforts to prevent hallucination. And this is one approach that we uh, look into the models across attention uh, and trace back the uh, predictions back to the input OCR and use the OCR confidence to help justify whether the prediction is uh, hallucinated or not and use that to uh, boost the model accuracy and also uh, capture some corner cases. Application number two is document classification. This is one of the reasons we want to include an encoder in our model architecture is that once we pre-train the model, we can use the both encoder decoder architecture as well as the encoder only part to do the document classification. Here we are showing an example of a multi-label classification where that we have a document in, uh, come in and then the encoder can uh, run a classification and tell, okay, uh, this document fall into doc class three and doc class Class uh, two, um, and give a score for each document type independently. Sabresh, so we'll talk about uh, the other two use cases. So the other um, use cases, the name matching, it's pretty unique to uh, our K uh, Uber. So uh, this is to match any kind of nicknames as well as what is the name in the document. Um, for example, like um, so, you can see that there are various uh, names. Like there is virginal, like variation types. I mean, so there is virginal, which is the Alexander G sample, and then we have different names, which of course you shouldn't match to. Then there is nickname, there is initials, uh, and whatnot. So we, the, if just by using a string matcher, you won't be able to uh, go through and uh, correctly match to all these use cases. So we. Uh, train a model to learn uh, associate like learn uh, various variations in the name associate nickname with the names as well as initials and things like that so for this um, instead of trying to extract name from each and every document what we do is we give a document image and we also give the name which we want to match it with so basically our model uh, takes that uh, encodes the input data and we provide the uh, profile name or any kind of name to our decoder. So, uh, and the model will predict whether a name <coughs> exists in some form in the document or not. And then we have receipt transcription. So basically, um, this is a, so be, uh, receipt are of various forms. We have various items. We have to extract uh, the like quantity as well as the weight of each uh, uh, items. And we want to, um, we also have what was ordered. So when user orders something from the Uber Eats, they also have, uh, like we have the digital copy of it. So we'll have to match what the physical copy of the receipt with the digital copy. And our CFM model helps in extracting various entities from the receipt. And then we have some matching criteria which will match it back to the digital receipt. Uh, next to the evaluation, so, <laughs> So here we have compared our model with GPT, human, as well as, uh, and, and you can see, um, so the yellow is our model's performance, uh, red is the human performance, and uh, blue is the GPT's for performance. Uh, and so our model actually beats both GPT and human considerably. And so one of the main error source is the OCR error. So, on the left, uh, there is a driving license. Like we have masked many of the parts of the image uh, just for privacy reasons. But so uh, it's an O uh, and then bunch of characters. So both GPT and Llama has like extracted that it does zero instead of O. And our model has learned to correct this by looking at various nuances in the image associated with the state and everything. And similarly, uh, there's a handwritten document on the right, and then the model. And I think GPT has done a very good job on it, as well as our model has. And then the Llama has still some OCRs in it. And we'll go to the demo. Previously recorded demo, but now we will do a live demo here. Uh, this is a dashboard we pr uh, prepared for this uh, presentation. And here we are going to show the first example of doing document transcription, where I'm going to upload a driver license image um, and I will run the models, uh, and then uh, let's see, let's see. Yes, so this is the driver license image, uh, and um, it 
the the task is to extract all the uh, the uh, target informations like driver license ID, expiration date, uh, and then names. Mm. Let's see. For some reason, it's not showing, but maybe we can go back to. Oh, here. Yeah. Um, so uh, ag again, uh, for each of the documents, uh, it has the target um, uh, fields to extract. So for these documents, it has a handful of documents, uh, a handful of fields. And here we are showing the model is extracting all the target information together with their scores. And the score can be used to indicate uh, how confident the model is and can be used to um, decide whether we want to drop these predictions and fall back to human or not. So this is an example of document transcription. And the second example, document classification, which I'm going to give a, uh, this one. So um, given this document, the models will predict uh, the score for each of the uh, intended uh, classes. And here it says that there are three classes that is likely to fall into a US driver license ID, as well as the US national ID, and US license history, which uh, are all correct. Um, and also image quality. Um, this is uh, also important uh, to provide um, the, the feedback to not only the, uh, whether the image has good quality or not, uh, whether it has any occlusions, blurries, but at the same time, whether this is a real ID or not. And here, we are showing a fake uh, US driver license ID as a banner, and it does uh, correctly capture that this is a relevant document and also not a photo of the original document, which is true. Um, lastly, name matching, a uh, little bit complex uh, to explain, um, but I think Sabresh has done a good job just to explain uh, that. And let's see this one. So uh, the, the goal of name matching is to 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 this matching whether this document is the right document to, that is expected for a uh, driver's profile. And say, let's say the, if the profile name is, uh, let's go here, Mac Loving. It will give a very con high con confidence score. But if we just say Loving, um, it will dramatically decrease. Um, if we give something different, like but it's inside the document, like how are you? Um, the model will also correctly tell this is not the right name uh, for this profile. So just to show this as a uh, uh, example of how we use uh, these models and. Um, uh, for all of those use cases, we have developed models based on the foundation model and deploy into production. Okay, uh, and in the very end, just to summarize, uh, we built this foundation model because we will have a very significant number of documents to process uh, of different document types. Um, and at the same time, it has a very high emphasis on accuracy. So we have to train a very strong foundation model uh, using all the in-house data uh, that we accumulate across years uh, to build uh, very uh, strong and adaptive models that we can use for fine-tuning a uh, um, variety of downstream applications. Um, and Ray's distributed framework definitely helps us in both the training as well as the evaluation uh, in this work. Um, this work is also uh, not only uh, by us, but also by a huge number of members inside uh, the, our teams. Um, and at the end, we are also hiring. So if you're interested, uh, please uh, reach out to us. Um, that brings the end to our presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to come to pick up the mic and we can um, have a discussion. Oh, uh, uh, thank you for your uh, presentation. I have a quick question. So for, the, for your uh, uh, in-house foundation model, how many parameters you have? And the, uh, also for the evaluation part, you mentioned that you can beat the human, right? And so what's the evaluation data set you have? And, uh, and uh, what's the ground truth label yeah, for that one? Yeah, 
Uh, mm -hmm. Let me go backwards. So first, evaluations. Uh, evaluation is a huge part for uh, this foundation model in a few aspects. One is we want to use the, we, we want to have a very comprehensive evaluation benchmark framework to tell us uh, if we throw a different type of treatment, uh, which one work, how do we pick up the right architecture, uh, and, uh, and, and also do a lot of experiments as uh, indications. So that's important. At the same time, uh, for all the models that we are going to deploy in production, it's very critical to meet, meet or re exceed human accuracy. Otherwise, we cannot deploy this model. So that's why uh, the accuracy is very important. Uh, and how do we build those evaluations? So internally, we built uh, for each document a golden data sets, which we accumulate, we sample uh, carefully documents uh, throughout the productions uh, and uh, apply multiple labelers to do cross-label check uh, to making sure the high quality label and use those to uh, evaluate the model. The scale is, could vary, but usually they are kind of at a scale of tens of uh, thousands of documents. Uh, per document type. So that's for the evaluation. In terms of how, what's the size of model, we have been exploring different size of the model. We find the sweet spot is around, um, say, uh, 0.5 billion to 1 billion size, uh, which is very easy to iterate, but and also at the same time very, very fast to, to serve. Uh, so that's the scale of our model. Yeah, hope this answers your question. Yeah, thank you. A uh, quick clarification on yeah. that last one before I ask my question. Is it uh, the decoder specifically that's the ha half billion to one billion, or is that including the encoder as well? It includes the encoder, decoder, as well as the image uh, component. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, Follow-up question, I guess, would be, uh, so on the OCR side, yeah. um, could you speak to sort of the decisioning around uh, using that over just sort of a purely vision approach? Uh, as well as do you have uh, sort of a, an internal OCR library that's specialized or are you using something more off the shelf like a Tesseract? Okay. Um, so we are not, so we don't train our own OCR model, so we do have third party vendors who provide OCR for us. Um, and the reason why we don't just use images is because it, the, just the image alone, uh, trying to extract information and giving a very accurate result, um, I don't think we have got good results we just by using vision only. So we definitely need the text extracted. And also, um, if you want, the s text in the image can vary for, like from really big to really small. So we'll have to account for a lot of things if you want to extract highly accurate transcription just by using image. So having a text f uh, along with the image helps. Just to uh, add two, uh, two points to that. Um, so. OCI itself could also have errors. So we kind of using OCI and vision to check each other. Uh, I think here we are showing the example of when you only have a vision, uh, you have a vision only model, um, it could make an error on like O versus zero and five versus S. Um, but at the same time, um, I think one of the things that we didn't emphasize a lot is the tokenizations. We also spend a lot of emphasis on um, tokenization uh, in both uh, tra training the tokenizer on our own uh, vocabulary, but at the same time spending a lot of uh, time de deciding uh, how, to, how to treat like digits, how to treat the leading and the middle digits, and also uh, uh, how to come up with special tokens to, for the document. Uh, so those are also uh, very critical for our um, performance in the end. And are you using BPE or? Uh, yeah, what we are using BPE. Okay, mm -hmm. all right, thank you so much. Hi, wonderful work. Um, yeah, thank you. I think you may possibly answered my question, but what, what area or what kind of roadblock or hurdle that you encountered that you didn't expect and it took up a lot more time than you originally expected, like for example, a tokenization or is there some aspect of the project because individually, you know, all the components are, I would say, pretty standard, you know. So is there something when you try to do this in scale and all these different things that you ran into a hurdle you didn't expect? Is there anything? Mm. It was mostly about scaling. Mm. You have anything you want to say? Uh, not specifically the part. Okay. And there are a lot of different things uh, that we encounter uh, in the middle. Um, just to give um, example, like uh, in when we when when we handle both OCR and images, they are both um, 
non-structure and at the same time they are also pretty big in size. So we need to do a lot of optimizations inside uh, inside each workers how we process, download, and also cache them. If we don't handle them carefully, the downloading speed could become the bottleneck. The uh, GPU could go out of disk because of the cache. Uh, so there are a lot of things that didn't we didn't anticipate much, but once we reach the scale of data, uh, that's what happened. And at the same time, um, this data wasn't just lying there ready for us. We need to uh, fetch them through some internal API. Uh, and we also hit a lot of like read limit because of the bursty nature of pre-training. That you will have a massive RPS uh, for a short period of time, but in other times it's stay flat. Uh, so all of those would become a technical challenge uh, in order to have this pre-training at a scale. And um. Yeah, I just remembered. So one important thing is the data noise. So we uh, accumulate data, so we train on 50 million documents and we have like humans who have labeled this. So that's not like the standard way of say transcribing some of the text, freeform text, and then we'll have to format it. We'll have to look for spelling errors. So there are certain fields which um, the humans are really bad at, like maybe because of changing uh, instructions over a period of time, so we'll have to standardize all those things. So that was one of the main uh, important things to consider when we scaled it up. Uh, is your model uh, mainly used for online serving or offline serving? Yeah, good question. Uh, our model is uh, primarily used for online serving. That's why we also mentioned the uh, the size is very ma uh, size matters uh, to choose the right size to uh, for uh, serving at scale. Yeah. Um, so if it's online serving, like, do you have like a strict uh, SLO, like for example, latency requirement for for your online services, and how do you like balance like latency with um, with throughput and uh, GPU utilizations? I think it's similar to all other real-time predictions uh, that you will have, you, you will get an SLA requirements from your partner or uh, the downstream use cases, and then uh, it's, then we, we, we need to come up with the decision in terms of both the model architecture as well as the optimizations on the serving side to meet that bar. Um, I think that's all I can disclose, yeah. Uh, um, so. Do you uh, did you use like uh, do you do quantization for your model or do you do quantization through uh, already in the training or to optimize for your model? Sorry. In training, we use mixed precision, but in in the serving, uh, we didn't use quantization uh, right now. But it's definitely in one of the roadmap uh, if we encounter more real time uh, like more strict uh, SLA requirements. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, just uh, had a quick question on how you would like handle edge cases and like failure cases. Say like your receipts like a little crumpled or like you know your driver license isn't like super like clear. Like how would you handle that? Like yeah, yeah. yeah. This is why we have that uh, image quality model on um, mm -hmm. that. Uh, that would partially help us to detect and also give feedback to uh, the user who upload those images uh, to give them instructions, oh, you should adjust your uh, angles, or you should adjust your lighting. Um, I think this is definitely the most effective way, but at the same time, in training and also, also serving, we have other techniques to help us to sample the right data, uh, as well as to uh, prevent those cases to affect our model performance. So is there like a particular like quality threshold of, for quality that like you kind of look for before you, you know, tell them, tell the user to, you know, go take a better picture or something like that? Or, yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah. we have models which will mm -hmm. basically tell you whether it's a good enough for not. Right. So mm -hmm. uh, that's also calibrated based on some kind of golden data set. All right, cool, mm -hmm. great, thank you. Uh, great work. Uh, can you speak a little bit about the adversarial examples um, in, into the training set? Like how far do you go in terms of getting the different types of adversarial examples, uh, or even to the extent of uh, synthesize it? Uh, uh, so missing date. Yeah. Um, so we don't synthesize any data. We have a lot of data for we, we process them. So with respect to sampling, we just sample based on document types. If that's what you're asking. And uh, but to give some example, um, I think there are a lot of uh, so our, our data was labeled by uh, human operators whose goal was to 
uh, transcribe those fields, and they will have a lot of different logic uh, or implicit uh, logic. Like if, for example, if the start date is January 1st, and there's no expiration date on the document, they will intend to add a one year uh, as an expiration date. So we also spend a lot of efforts trying to identify those samples because you don't want to teach the model to hallucinate. Um, there are certain biases that we want to prevent uh, the model to learn from. So we also need to spend time to uh, identify those from our training data and exclude them uh, uh, from the data sets. Uh, and I hope that can serve as a one example of the adversarial, even though it's not intended to be adversarial, but in the end, it definitely pose some challenges or mistakes to the model. Yeah, yeah definitely help with the out of example yeah, scenario. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I have three quick questions. First, the question is about the, um, uh, the multitask uh, you are mentioned in the Slack, yeah. So for that part, could you share more uh, how your model handles that different multitask in the same model run? In the same? Same, same model run. Same yeah. model run, yeah. yeah. So, uh, sorry, can you clarify the question? I didn't. How, how do you uh, handle the multitask mm -hmm. in the same model run? You, you use different uh, header, right? Oh, multi head, uh, and uh, how you, so oh. here you never share the architecture about yeah. that part, yeah. So we have one single decoder, which mm -hmm. does all the decoder-related tasks, mm -hmm. and then we have encoder for which we have multiple heads based on the task we have. So um, our training pipeline is configured in such a way that you can assign probabilities to each task, and based on the probabilities, each data sample we have gets assigned to these particular tasks. I see. So that is for the case when there's only one head, but uh, for example, we have other heads uh, to, that is intended for different tasks. Like for example, uh, we have another head for document classification. So in that case, uh, the example will feed into the encoder and it will go to the multiple heads and each of them will generate their own loss. So we will uh, add the loss together to back propagate uh, uh, to optimize the model. At the same time, when we do monitoring, which is the part we haven't uh, talked much about, in the monitoring, we will also mm -hmm. monitor those training loss separately uh, mm -hmm. to monitor progress. Uh, and we also have a callback to print out the examples uh, of each of the tasks in the training so that to, to do sanity check as well as to do qualitative check. How do you design different weight for different tasks? Mm. It's uh, basically an experimentation. And uh, okay. for, uh, for us, the uh, field extraction is the most important task, so that's uh -huh. where we have most weight on, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Second question is about the multi-language uh, support. Yeah. So you have 10 languages. Uh, 10 plus, yeah. Yeah, 10 plus language. Yeah, yeah. how do you support the multilingual here? So we train our tokenizer on our data, and the tokenizer learns the tokens for e all the languages. So we don't do anything more specific to each language for now. Yeah. Oh, I see. Tokenization. I see. So you ch OK. The last question is about the, um, you have 120 different uh, types. Yeah. That is T the, types. Yeah. yeah. So that's the, um, that's the 120 <laughs> classification model. Like, multiple classification model for this uh, foundation model, right? Um, both the classification part, but also the decoder part. Uh, on the classification part, yes, uh, it's going to be 120 different class for classification. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it also means that uh, there are these diversity of data in the per training, mm -hmm. uh, which is very important for model to learn how to extract the key information from those different, those variety of the types. Yeah, so it's intended for both purposes. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, so interesting talk. I just want to ask a little bit about, uh, I walked halfway through, so I probably m might have missed the first piece. But uh, you mentioned something about um, an ID of a person being uh, able to identify if that was a generated ID or not. Um, so uh, the question I had is around, first of all, like the data set that you, how, how did you come up with the data set? that you have for? Sorry, can you repeat the specifically the data scenario set? you want to capture? Um, yeah. So I want to I, I understand that, like, let's say, um, let, let's say I have a driver's license, and yeah. how do, can you detect if this is actually valid? Is that something that your platform can do, or is this not, not like, necessarily? So right now, the we just analyzed the image of the uh, up 
picture the and are uploaded based on that the, our image quality model will identify whether it's a valid or not valid image of the document yeah uh, sorry well, i didn't get the last part what do you mean so basically based on image classification we can identify whether it's a valid image or a valid document i mean yeah okay and to be able to do that what is the yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, I can. Yeah, sure. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.